So thank you very much, you all. Um, so symbolic data analysis is my most recent uh, um, topic that I really uh, uh, found about it. And it is a great pleasure for me to talk about these ideas related with histogram principal component analysis and how can we use it for uh, detecting internet traffic redirection attacks. So this is a co-work with uh, an subtil Eduard Mendes and Lino Oliveira, but the person who have collected the data, the, the, the person from the telecommunication side is Paul Salvador from, from Instituto Telecomunicações uh, from uh, Aveiro University. So very briefly, I'm going to do a, a, a introduce a motivation about the problem and uh, and then I'm going to try to describe how we can see that this data has symbolic data. And then we're going to talk about uh, histograms are a kind of a strange ob object to be uh, seen as data points in a generalized uh, way of saying it. So how can we do operations with it? And how can we uh, define uh, principal component analysis for this kind of data sets. And then we'll talk about some final remarks and, and eventually some future work. So the problem of internet redirection attacks is that um, everything that now is related with uh, internet security is a very important topic. And the idea is that we have a contract with an ISP provider and we access internet by uh, uh, following this kind of uh, link uh, established by, by this company. The problem is that sometimes the traffic that we are generating, so when we want to access to some information through the internet, that can be a, a, a third person, if you want, call it a man in the middle, that somehow is uh, uh, redirecting our uh, traffic and eventually accessing in an illicit way to the information that we are uh, sharing. So uh, the monitoring structure and the ways to uh, avoid this kind of attacks can be only done by the company that is providing your internet connection but has a private person or has a private company, you may want to have a, a structure that allows you to uh, identify in a faster way if your traffic is being under redirection attacks. And this was the motivation of uh, uh, Salvador and Nogueira, uh, who uh, uh, built this kind of structure to try to, in a very fairly uh, uh, easy and with the low resources, uh, we could uh, 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 have a, a, a monitoring structure to try to identify if our traffic was being uh, under this kind of attacks. So the idea is that the machine that is going to be eventually the target of the attacks will call it in this work the target and the probes are a kind of a structure that we will uh, uh, have to help us identify if we are or not under an attack. So imagine that we have here the machine that we want to uh, monitor and we have a structure of probes uh, 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 spread uh, around the, 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 the planet. And the idea is that we are going to measure what is called round trip time. So the idea is that your probe it's going to send a packet to the machine, your machine, and then the machine will going to answer back to the probe, and we are going to count this time. This is what we call round or guys from telecommunications call round trip time. So the problem is that it can be the third man in the middle or the man in the middle that can uh, force your uh, information to go through a, a third machine that's we call it a relay, and being illicitly assessing our, um, our traffic and our information. And this is what we want to uh, um, monitor. The idea is that 
uh, if you have uh, uh, an attack, then the ground trip time will suffer an increase. And this is in a way what we are looking for. So um, we have a structure of 12 probes and four targets, if you want, four machines that are going to be uh, uh, monitoring and three potential, four potential relays. So the attackers will be located in these places. So for each machine, we are going to generate a data set and we are going to address and build a system to try to identify these potential uh, um, attacks or anomalies, if you want. And this is the structure, how it was mounted, uh, uh, developed by Salvador and Nogueira and co-workers. So the reds are the uh, uh, points that are going to attack the traffic. The blues are the machines that we want to monitor. It, and the uh, greens are the infrastructure that is spread around trying to identify, to help us to count these round trip times. Uh, so the data that we have available is uh, um, uh, every 120 seconds, a probe sends 10 packets, and we measure 10 RTT uh, uh, measurements, round trip times. And then for these 10 measurements, we can calculate uh, basic uh, descriptive statistics like the minimum, the average, the median or the, the maximum. This is the information that we had available. And um, we, we had a period of time. So this is just the average RT uh, uh, round trip time. And we see that the darker uh, zones uh, refers to attacks. And there are some which is quite clear that there is an increase in the, the average round trip time but there are others that things are a little bit less clear if they are or not uh, attacks. We must have in mind that regular traffic, which is the rest of the traffic can have spikes and can have perturbations that are things that are uh, normal, let's say from the traffic point of view. And we need to make a difference between these spikes and the, the, the zones on the, the darker areas, which is the, the, the attacks, the, let's call it the anomalies. So uh, the idea is that uh, for each probe, which is the machine that is helping us to measure the round trip times in different spots of the planet. And the idea is that is cover uh, uh, all possibilities of trying to monitor uh, these this attacks. So once more, the idea is that if we, our machine that we want to protect is located on Hong Kong and we have a probe in Chicago, Vinha del Mar, Johannesburg and LA, the, shed, the darker zone refers to uh, um, attacks and uh, you see that uh, once more, there are a few that are quite simple and easy to, to uh, uh, be detected by certain probes, but not as easily by other probes that eventually are nearer and it's uh, harder to detect this kind of redirection attacks. So this is the type of challenges that we are going to face. Some attacks will be quite hard to detect all the times and other ones will be always quite simple and quite uh, easily uh, uh, detect by any method that we can uh, think of. And this is going to be our data. So this is going to be this kind of observations. This is the medium uh, round trip time. And we are going to address this as a, a feature or a variable if you want. So this is the data that we have available. And the idea is that, well, the conventional strategy was to use the average round trip time to develop a clever strategy to identify these. And Salvador and Nogueira proposed a method that was quite successful, uh, but we tried to address the same uh, uh, issue in a different way and eventually trying to uh, improve certain topics of, of uh, the initial uh, strategy. 
So the idea is that given a timestamp, a moment of time where you have these 10 uh, round trip times measurements, you can uh, uh, calculate or obtain the minimum, the average, the median or the maximum value for these 10 values, or, and we can consider the average, like the, uh, I'm sorry, sorry. Um, we can consider the average has the, um, your conventional measure, but we can try to take a better, uh, 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 um, a, a better way uh, or an alternative way to condense and work with this kind of information. So we could uh, think about an interval and say that, well, these 10 measurements uh, goes between this value and that one, and we have an interval, or we can do something slightly different and say that 50% 50, 50 of the observations are between this value and the median and another 50% between the median and the maximum value. And this gives us the easiest and simple histogram that we can think about it. Um, and this is how we are going to work with the data. So instead of the average, we are going to use the data uh, uh, using this kind of structure. Um, so once more, we have the minimum, the median, and the maximum, and we are going to take these values in order to build our histograms. And for each time stamp and for each probe, we will have uh, a minimum value, a median, and a maximum value, so an histogram something like this that we have here. And our data will be a kind of two intervals, each one with uh, an assigned probability, if you want, which is the frequency of the observations within each of the uh, sub-intervals or bins, if you want to call it this way. So our data points on a certain feature will look like this, okay? Um, the, the, the initial proposal of uh, Salvador and Nogueira was to develop uh, what we call the heuristic uh, method based on the uh, average uh, round trip time, which what they have proposed is a sliding window. And for this window, they calculate the average. This window only contains regular, what is assigned has regular observations. They calculate the average and they decide if the next point uh, or the next timestamp, uh, if the average RTT of the next timestamp is higher than a certain constant times, the mean values of uh, uh, within the window, then it is uh, considered has a potential attack. Otherwise, it is assigned as a regular observations and to eliminate uh, false negatives, uh, they consider that only a, a, a consecutive uh, 10 observations being classified as an anomaly is going in fact to be declared as an attack. Because it is supposed that these redirection attacks uh, uh, have a certain uh, minimum duration. So our proposal was, uh, to try to work with this in a slightly different way. So once more, the conventional strategy was we pick one probe. Each probe is described by its average uh, uh, bound trip time. And then we're going to assign for each observation based on the sliding window if an observation is regular here represented in blue. If it is a sign has an attack, it's going to be uh, uh, represented in red. The, the, uh, the greens are regular observation wrongly assigned by the, the, um, the, the, the heuristic has anomalies because we have a shift in the traffic there. And uh, um, once more, this is how, how it goes. But given that we have several uh, probes, the idea is that one probe can miss a certain uh, attack. For instance, the uh, orange represents observations that were 
a text but wrongly assigned as regular by the heuristic applied to probe number two. And the idea of the author is that, well, maybe one probe cannot detect an attack, but the others will. And he's building what uh, uh, can be summarized as a voting rule saying that, well, if you have 50% of more of the probes declare a certain observation has an attack, then it is globally uh, assigned as an attack. Um, and this is kind of the final decision. For instance, in this case, uh, only one probe was able to correctly identify the traffic has an attack. So it will be wrongly assigned as a regular traffic, even though it is um, an attack. So the strategy of the original proposal was doing a kind of anomaly detection probe by probe, and then combine information to obtain a global classification for each of your observations. We propose to do uh, the, the same in a way, but in a, different, in a different way. So we propose first to combine the information about the probes, try to summarize this global pattern of the round trip times uh, for all the probes. But remember that we have histograms instead of uh, real numbers. So we intended to combine the information of the probes doing uh, uh, principal component analysis, but now develop to um, histogram uh, type of data. And then hopefully the first principal component will be an overall uh, um, measure of uh, uh, the, the traffic volume, volume. And if so, then this can be used as the input for a strategy similar to heuristic or other to uh, correctly identify the attacks. So we combine information of the probes first, and then we use the scores. Uh, and for now, we the scores are going to be histograms as well but we can summarize the information for each histogram by its mean that we uh, uh, represent here by the pink dots. And then with these pink dots that are now a conventional uh, 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 variable, we can apply, for instance, the heuristic and uh, form a line to decide anything below this line is regular, anything higher. It means that a huge volume will be assigned as an, um, an attack. And this is our strategy. strategy. To uh, do so, we need to uh, define what is histogram principal component analysis, but first we need to understand how can we do operations with this new type of data set, and then we'll follow this strategy and apply it to our data. Okay, so the first task that we need to, to solve is how can we uh, do operations with histograms? And uh, then after we have this idea, um, how can we measure associations and how can we build a covariance matrix based on a, a, a multivariate uh, vector of uh, histogram uh, uh, variables? And this is the two uh, topics that I'm going to address before we're going to tackle the applied problem once more. So the first thing, how can we do operations with histograms? Well, if we have two different histograms, the challenge is how can we sum this kind of thing? And the idea is more or less quite straightforward. So we're going to do some uh, initial uh, pre-processing of the data. So we're going to, in a way, uh, change slightly this histogram such that each of these bars would be, or each of these probabilities assigned to each histogram will be the same. So we call this harmonization. And the idea is that each bin will have the same probability. And for each pair of beans with the same probability, then we're going to combine this information uh, doing operations interval by interval. So once more, 
how do we do this kind of harmonization? We call it this way to do it such a way that we cut in a way this histogram such that the probability here represented as the high of the histogram will be the same for X1 and histogram one and two. So we do it by assuming that data within each interval or sub-interval will have a uniform distribution. Okay, we'll, we'll see in a moment with an example how to do this. So let's imagine that we have the two histograms and we want to do this kind of harmonization. The first thing is that we need to look for the cumulative probability uh, distribution associated with each of the beams. So we have 0 0.5, 0 0.8 and one, and here 0 0.4 and one. And to do this harmonization, we have to guarantee that uh, the, the uh, final version of these histograms share the same accumulative uh, uh, distribution. So we'd have uh, need to have a beam with probability 0 0.4 and then the accumulative of the first to 0 0.5, 8, and 1. And this is obtained by combining the two uh, prob cumulative probabilities of the two beams. And then how can we go from 0 0.5 to 0 0.4? Well, we assume that data is uniformly distributed between minus 5 and minus 2, and we do the cutoffs in a way that we fulfill this kind of requirements for the cumulative probability. We do the same for the two histograms, and now we do operations beam by beam. So we sum the values of the, the uh, intervals that characterize the first beam of the harmonized uh, first histogram with the second one, and we do it this way. So we end up by uh, I'm sorry, I skipped one, but we end up by, this is the two harmonized histograms, and then we pick the first bin, the second one, and then we do the sum of two intervals that given the more uh, uh, stru uh, algebraic structure, we know how to do it. So we just have to sum the centers of the two intervals and uh, uh, the range of the, the final combination of the two histograms is going to be the sum of the ranges of each of the histograms. For doing the differences where things start to be more complicated. But the idea once more is that if you want to do a difference, what we have to do is to think about the histogram associated with minus X2. And then we're going to do the harmonization between X1 and minus X2 and proceed as uh, thinking about the sum of these two. And this is what is done here. So we do exactly the same strategy. We think about minus X2. We think about the cumulative probabilities that are being shared. We assume uniform distribution within the beams and then we combine in the usual way. So we end up by doing a sum of the two first uh, sub-intervals of each of the two histograms leading to this kind of strategies. And we do this bin by bin, and we end up has the difference of the two histograms. The problem here is when we do the difference of an histogram with itself, apply this kind of strategies, uh, unfortunately or not, we don't end with a zero. So the difference between X1 and X1 is not zero, a little bit like we are used to in uh, um, real numbers. So we end up in a way with a uniform distribution associated with it. Okay, so we need to know by working with this more complex structure, uh, in a way we need to pay a price and the price is that we are going to lose some algebraic properties that we are very used to them. And this is a little bit, uh, um, well, it is the price, the price to pay in a way. So to do linear combinations, you just need to think about what is the sign of the constants uh, and then do the harmonizations in the previous way. But now, depending if the constant is positive or negative, you have to uh, do the harmonization for 
the plus or the minus uh, of your uh, uh, histograms. And then after the harmonization, you do the operations once more going to interval uh, uh, operations that are quite uh, known and well worked with Moore and later on by many other people, okay? And once more, we will repeat it beam by beam. And this is how we do it. So what goes well with this kind of structure is this type of operations. What it goes wrong is that the difference of an histogram with itself is not zero. And we need to be a little bit careful about this distribution, this kind of properties that we have over here. OK, so. Um, this is the price to pay, but at least we know what can we do and where are the limitations of this kind of structure. So the next challenge is, well, we have data with a more complex structure. We know how to do operations and we know the strong points and the weak points of the operations that we have available. How do we uh, uh, calculate summary statistics, which is vital for analyzing the data? So now our data, our sample is histograms. So each of these X1, XH, XN is one histogram, okay? That let's assume for now that they have been uh, harmonized uh, already. So how do, can we define a mean, a variance, a covariance, a correlation, the sample mean, uh, the sample counterparts of these kind of things? So. Up to now, there are three main ideas to deal with this kind of thing. The first and the, the simple, and in the beginning, uh, the, the first main idea was, um, let's think about a clever way to transform symbolic data into conventional data and then apply everything that we know with all the good properties of all that we know and the statistics have, the knowledge that we have, from centuries up to now. That was the idea of the first uh, uh, authors. And they say, well, let's pick the mean of each histogram. And then this mean is a real number. And this is a re representative of the histogram. And then let's do everything that we know. Sample means, sample variance, sample covariance of these means has been the symbolic uh, quantities. So, if we have an histogram, we can calculate the mean in the usual way, but just thinking about his as a discrete probability distribution, we calculate the mean for each histogram. And now we have a set of n histograms for each histograms we have a mean, and then we calculate the means of these points, and this is the symbolic mean, okay? Uh, if you want to do for the covariance, we do the same. So. We calculate the mean of each of these histograms. We think about the vectors of the, the means, the, the histogram means has multivariate points in here it was in R3. And then we pick this, this mean values and we treat it as conventional multivariate data set and we calculate sample covariance and correlation in this way. Okay. Okay, so. This was the initial idea, the first straightforward approach, but then people were thinking that maybe we're losing some information. So can we do it better? The next best idea was, well, let's treat histograms as a sequence of intervals. And these intervals have a weight and these weights are probabilities, okay? So let us think that uh, we have, uh, the data that we actually do not observe because it's the thing that within these beams. So let's imagine the 10 round trip times that we don't have access. We are going to assume that uh, they are organized in these intervals and within the intervals, we are going to assume that we have a random variable. So in a way, the, the symbolic data, the micro data associated with your histograms can be seen as being equal to this random variable x1 if your uh, variable is within the first bin, it is equal to xj if your data is within the second bin, et cetera, et cetera. And 
for now, we are assuming that these A's follow a uniform distribution. And then they have derived authors like Biller and D, they have derived mean, variance, covariance, and because of that, covariance matrices and mean vectors, sample versions of it. Okay, that's the next big idea. A little bit more recently, another author have thought that, I think it was even, well, Paula Britt can tell you better, in a better way than me and, and, and Sonia as well, but I think the idea was probably a little bit motivated by clustering, saying that it is almost a little bit disappointing that the mean is a real number. So we have a structure of points that follow um, an, histogram an histogram data, but then the mean, it isn't a point of the same type of your observations. It's a real number. So in a way, people thought, can we think about a clever way to find the location uh, a summary of the location of your points that is also an histogram. And the idea of uh, Verde and Irpin was, well, let's think about the distance between any point of my sample to a center measure. And this center measure is going to be also an um, histogram. And let's identify this location measure as being the value that minimize the sum of the square of the distance. Of course, the distance has to be uh, designed in a way to deal with this kind of data. But that's, that's the idea. And to calculate this, people uh, usually uh, uh, propose that we do this harmonization such that we have uh, 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 beams with equal probability because all the harmonization operation will turn out to be much, much easier. Uh, that's the third main idea. There are others, but this is, I, I would say, the central three ideas related with uh, 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 location, uh, 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 variance, and, and covariance. So a little bit for making a slightly more clear this final idea, which is now the location is an histogram and uh, they call it very centered for, for simplicity. Uh, but the idea is that, well, we pick in your data set and in a way you design this location that has been proved that has a very nice structure. It's like um, your new uh, um, histogram will have the, the center of the first beam has the mean of the centers of all the beams, first beam centers of all the histograms. So uh, you end up by, you can describe your histogram by the minimum, the, the, the limits of your intervals and the probability. And now these probabilities are the same for all the, the, the histograms, but then you can describe this by the vector of the centers. Uh, one for uh, um, each uh, bin, the vector of the ranges, one for each bin, and the probability associated with each of the bins. So the, the Berry Center turns out to be a kind of a, the mean of all these uh, 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 subintervals or bins, if you want. And then if you think of the mean of the Berry Center, then it is the mean how the first two proposals have uh, defined, which is quite convenient. So for the mean point of view, all the three uh, uh, proposals in the end agree in some sense. So we know how to build the covariance matrix, which is what we really want for principal component analysis. And we use it quite frequently in the conventional domain as a dimensionality reduction method. So we usually um, look to it as finding the directions with the highest variability. We project the data in this direction. The next principal component is going to be the linear combination of your variables that has the second highest variability, uh, verifying a certain restrictions uh, related with uh, the data being uncorrelated that turns out to be uh, um, 
the directions to be orthogonal. So we are looking for um, the directions to project the data such that your principal component is going to be defined has the linear combinations of your original feature where the weights are such that you maximize the variability of your new features of your principal components. And this turns out to be the eigen, the weights are defined as the eigenvectors of the covariance matrix associated with your random vector. So in symbolic and well, just to reinforce the idea of uh, dimensionality reduction, we can use the first principal components to summarize what are the, the, the structure, more interesting and common structure of your data. And you can use the first principal components as the input for other statistical methods. And it can be seen as a preprocessing step uh, for the analysis. And this is what we are going to do with our uh, uh, problem. So we have our data. Remember that now the data are histograms. So each uh, uh, row is um, uh, uh, an observation, the histogram associated with uh, uh, the set of 12 probes that we have available for a given timestamp. And the idea is that, well, we can use, if you can use the data to summarize um, sample covariance metrics in a, 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 a clever way, let's put it this way, in a, in a sound way, then we can calculate eigenvalues and eigenvectors and doing the similarity with uh, the usual or conventional principal component analysis, then we can define and use these eigenvectors to define the weights of your linear combinations and projecting your points in this linear combination, you have the scores of your first uh, principal component. And these scores are histograms because we are defining linear combination as we have done in the beginning of this talk. But, uh, uh, well, before saying what we are going to do next, just a soft reminder. This is quite common in, in symbolic data analysis. We start with symbolic data, which is the data metrics that we have here. And then we turn these in a covariance metrics that is a matrix that verify all the properties of a, a covariance matrix in the conventional um, area. And for this covariance matrix, we do like in principal component in the conventional framework. So we are doing things in a conventional framework. And then we have this way to turn the scores to write them as symbolic. And this is done by doing linear combinations of histograms in the way we have defined after. So to use this as input for the anomaly detection methods, we're going just to summarize the first principal component uh, uh, values of projected data has its mean values. And this once more turns to be uh, univariate observations or univariate random uh, um, or, or not random, but or a set of n observations, univariate observations, so uh, things in uh, uh, real numbers. And then we are going to ap uh, apply uh, uh, anomaly detection method. So once more, going back to our specific data, we have the for each timestamp, 12 probes, so 12 histogram variables. Uh, each one summarized by two intervals, each one with the same probabilities. Uh, and they can be written this way or just has a set of centers, ranges, and probabilities. And then we applied principal component analysis, estimating the covariance metrics in the way I have described before. And then we can go back and use the knowledge that we have about conventional principal components to say that, well, for each of the data sets, and we have a data set per target, the first principal component explains in all the four data sets 
uh, always more than 80% of the total variability. And if you look to the loadings, we can even uh, add some explanation of what these linear combination, uh, combinations actually are. So these columns, each of these columns are um, the first eigenvector of a certain sample covariance matrix. Okay, so these are four different uh, uh, principal component analyses. But the idea, if your target is Chicago, then the probes that will be more important in your linear combinations are the one located in the uh, America continent, with the exception of Sao Paulo, which is a probe that suffered some problems, and the traffic never uh, uh, um, registered any, any changes. So this probably was a problem with the, the, the the measurements done in, in with the, the team, the telecommunication team. So uh, if your target is London, then what it happened is that all the probes are interesting, except for describing the traffic uh, in London, the ones located in the American continent. And we could go for the other two data sets, but for simplicity, I'm going to jump for the other interpretations. So what we have proposed to do the heuristic in the point of view of our method is that now our input, this is just the mean of the scores of the first principal component. So we had a, pre a first principal component, which is histograms, we calculate the mean, and then we follow the same idea of the heuristic. If the sliding window containing just regular observations, the calculate its mean, and if a new observation, and this new observation characterized by the mean of the projected data uh, on the first principal component overcomes this, this limit, it will be declared as an attack, and we do the rule of 10 just to eliminate potential uh, um, false positives. We do the same, a slightly different strategy for using the Tukey method. So instead of this mean value, we would like uh, to use something that we think also take into uh, uh, consideration the variability of the data. So we are considered the third quantile uh, plus three times the interquantile range. And the sliding window works in the same way. So to compare the methods, we are going to use four measurements. The first one is the recall, which is the, the estimated probability of if an observation is attack is correctly assigned as an attack. The false positive rate, which is if it is regular, to be wrongly assigned as an attack and the optimal value will be zero. Then the precision, if it is classified as an attack, what is the chance to really be an attack? And finally, the F1 measure, that is the harmonic mean of the recall and the precision. Okay, a way to combine both, which is quite popular. So if we go to our data and we have here the heuristic, we have here the tucky, the lines represent the thresholds de uh, defined accordingly to each of the method. We see for the target Chicago one, we always, uh, uh, both of the methods can uh, uh, completely and correctly identify all the uh, attacks, which is quite clearly separate from the regular traffic with this data. Even though we have here some points, regular traffic that was wrongly uh, classified initially by the Turkey method uh, has been Anomalies, the rule of 10 will uh, uh, eliminate these kind of things. And the important thing is that if you compare this with the, the conventional heuristic where we just apply similar strategies, but just using the mean of the 10 are uh, round trip times, then we see that we have a slightly worse results. Well, the most challenging case is Hong Kong where the heuristic fails to detect the reds are uh, um, LA attacks, uh, uh, redirection attacks uh, uh, perpetrate 
by uh, LA, forcing the traffic to, to go through LA. Um, and there are a few missing in the Madrid uh, uh, relay. So this was correctly detected by the Tuki. Um, and uh, even though the heuristic was unable to detect uh, uh, Madrid, uh, nevertheless, it could detect correctly Moscow, which didn't happen with the conventional heuristic. So the heuristic, even though it has his, uh, uh, was kind of a better results with the Turkey, uh, but doing it with taking into consideration the histogram structure, we get, uh, generally speaking, overall better results. So as final remarks, um, we uh, just try to formalize and discuss what is this algebraic structure when applied to histograms. And this has been done with quantile functions, but I think this is another way to see the same thing. And well, well my point of view is uh, it brings another light into the same problem. And then the general idea of doing operations is histograms is then we fix the probabilities distribution to be the same. And then we do operation bean by bean using what we know about operations with intervals. And these operations are done using the Moore's uh, proposals. Um, the problem with the Moore is that the ranges, even though we do differences, are always increasing. So it looks like whatever operations you are doing, you are increasing the, the, the length, the range of your interval. And this is many times seen as a drawback of this way to look for operations with uh, uh, our intervals and by default histograms. Um, in this case, we can discuss that. This is totally uh, 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 justified by the way uh, Moore understood operations with intervals. So it is how it is designed. It is supposed to be like this even though it can be a drawback from the applied point of view, the, 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 the thing with principal component analysis is that your weights have norm equal to one. So you are not expecting that this is going to explode by just doing combinations of a lot of features because the weights will always be such that they will have norm equal to one. Um, so we give and make it a little bit explicitly and clear what is a linear combination of histograms according to the, this perspective. And by uh, knowing an explicit way uh, of formalize what a linear combination it is, then we can project our data and with the projected data on the first principal components like in the conventional uh, um, uh, areas, we can use these as initial input for other statistical methods. Uh, and this can be uh, an interesting strategy here. It turns out that the first linear combination is many times uh, a volume of what you are observing. And this is what we really are looking for, for detecting this type of attacks. So here it seems like it makes all the sense and it turns out to be a good strategy. And um, so, and that's what we have done to, de to detect this type of anomalies. Um, Tuki seems to be a little bit better than the heuristic. So taking into consideration the variability and not just the mean of the regular observations within this sliding window seems to be an interesting uh, strategy to follow. Um, and we are dealing with symbolic principal component, hence an application of uh, a dimensionality reduction strategy, just like we are used to do on conventional uh, data analysis. And this can be used as an input for other symbolic methods or conventional ones. And in fact, we have used it as a conventional 
method to detect anomalies. So thank you very much for listening to me. I hope you have enjoyed and learn and be interested in uh, symbolic data analysis.